revived church. After all, as the church goes, so goes the world. We need to seize the moment we have been given. In these days of deep darkness and moral compromise, the body of Christ cannot afford to remain a sleeping giant. While society as a whole and even pockets of Christianity is embracing sin as acceptable, the church is abandoning the power of Pentecost. The very dynamic, listen now, the very dynamic that set us apart to begin with is what many have considered unpopular, controversial, and divisive. It's time for us to go after revival with full force. We'll see how much you mean that amen in a minute. Listen, we're not asking God for something new and different. We are longing for a restoration of the old, the ancient, and the powerful. What is he referring to? He's referring to the day of Pentecost, to the day in Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit of the Lord descended as tongues of fire on them and equipped them and empowered them to do the work of the Lord and to live in the hell that life tried to throw at them. If something is in need of being revived, the implication is that it's close to death. Would you agree? Let me give you a, a, a for instance. Butch, my Tawana, keeps giving me lists of things to do too. And so she keeps reminding me, now I'm going to say this out loud and she's going to tell me later, now everybody rides by our house is going to talk about it. You shouldn't have said it. But she keeps reminding me, Mark, our shutters need painting. Mark, our shutters need painting. And you look at them, and I say, well, you know, that grayish black look ain't bad. And when it rains, it looks dark and black again. So just go outside when it rains. Right? What's happening? After a while, even though they tell you that it's color fast and doesn't fade for 10 years, they fade it. What happens? What's going on? What is she saying? We need to revive the color, the brightness of that color, the richness of that color. So what does that indicate? It indicates that those shutters are dying in their way, right? They're, they're, they're losing. Whatever is needing to be revived is in a state of growing cold. It's in a state of hardening. It's in a state of losing. It's in a state of dying. It's in a state of drying up or falling down. What happens when the, when a, if you've got a fire pit in your yard? What happens, or in a fireplace, when, the fire, when it starts cooling off in the room? What do you do? You go and poke and stir the fire, right? You add another log. What are you doing? You're reviving it. You're moving it forward. A few weeks ago, I won't go into all this detail, but I just want to tell you this because the witness is sitting right here. A few weeks ago, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was physically attacked to the point it woke her up. She thought I was dying because I was actually choking in the dream. Okay? And the choking woke me up. I was literally had something had its hands on my throat and was choking me. All right? And later that week as I awoken and, 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 and the Lord was able to give us some indication of what that was because she, it woke her up. It disturbed her, the fact that I was gasping for breath. And later that week, the Lord told me this. I am putting upon you a heavy weighted anointing. And we always hear that as anointing. We go, oh, wow, yeah, that's it. But the words that got my attention was when the Lord said a heavy weighted anointing. Like weighted like the weight of gold. Like 
uh, a heavy, not a burden, but powerful, but rich in terms of what God was doing. And here's why he said that. This is what I'm about to give you. He said, because whatever you choose to call it, to describe it, if it needs reviving, something has to take place. Okay? And here's what he told me. I'm putting this on you. And the enemy knows it. And he wants to choke the words that I'm giving you out of you. Mark, the activity of, a, of reviving starts in, ready? Hard places. The activity of reviving starts in dark places. It starts in messed up places. It starts in lonely places. Reviving starts in wounded places. And Mark, to go into dark places, to go into hard places, to go into wounded places of people's lives requires a weighted anointing because they will lash out. How many of you understand that reviving means if something needs reviving, that means it's in a state of dying. And if something is dying, it takes strong measures to pull it from the brink of death back into life. Anybody in the house? And for that to happen, for work like that, there has to be some things that are done, and you have to get some stuff out in order to create an environment for growth. You and I, if we want to abstain from dying, there may be some things that have to come out before it can open up and make it fertile enough for him to grow. Y'all don't even care about hearing this today. I'm telling you I'm not preaching a sermon on a Sunday for you to be in church. I'm giving you a prophetic word of 2021 that part of the weapon of you getting through 2021 will be to understand the process of allowing your life to be revived allowing revive what fill in the blank revive my marriage or revive uh, a wayward child or revive my health or revive my finances or revive my mindset of the way I'm thinking or whatever you need God to revive there are some things in the dark places of your heart and mind or in the lonely places or the wounded places or the hard-hearted places that have to be done. And so there are certain elements. When the Lord gave me that, it made me want to throw up. Lord, I didn't ask for a weighted anointing. I didn't ask for that. I mean, after all, I'm not even on social media. That ought to give me some good points. I'm not one of them people. I didn't ask for this. I don't want this. And he simply said, but you wanted me, more of me. And I don't give you more of me just for Come on, just for you. If God revives things in you, if he pulls things in you, if he puts life in you, it ain't just for you. It's for other people. And it's for other people in their captivity and in their bondages. How many of you know you can walk around thinking you're free and still be in bondage? And God has to revive. A lot of us in here, he just simply needs to change the mindset of how we think about life, change the mindset of how we think about God, change the mindset of how we think about what happens to us in life. If this country, if people would just change the mindset away from victimology, it'd be a better place. If you quit running around here thinking that you deserve to do what you deserve to do because everybody did it to you and all of a sudden you're a victim and so that justifies you doing what you want to do, if you just get that crap out of your life, you'd be a much better person. That's the God. Because you will never get out of the mud staying a victim of everything that happens. 
And God just simply says, you know what? If I could get you out of the prison of your mind, if I could just get you out of the prison of your mind, life would be better for you. You would just see it better. You would see it differently. And so there are certain elements, if you want that to happen, if reviving, if the act of reviving is going to take place in you or your family or your parents or your marriage, or if you're a young person and you just think the church is the place you go and you've never really experienced what it is to be alive in Christ, if you want that stuff to begin to happen, there's some elements, there's some ingredients, there's that perfect storm stuff that has to come together for you to begin to see the heartbeat at the other side. So we're going to try to talk about some of these pretty quickly. Now I want you to be aware of these elements as you seek the Lord in the coming days and in the coming weeks. I want you to, to re remember these things I'm telling you. Spirit of the living God, drill it in us. Don't let us forget it. Don't let us walk out of here. But bring it back to our memory. Bring it back into our lives, I pray. So, Here's the first element. In Hosea, in the Old Testament, in Hosea chapter 6, everything I've just said to you is taking place. The people have been far from God. And they've begun calling out for him to help them. And here's what he says in Hosea chapter 6. Here's the prophetic word. You can take the word that's here out and put the word revive in. But you ready? It says, come let us return to the Lord. Look at it. For he has torn us. Do you don't think 2020 didn't tear you? You can sit around here if you want to and blame God for everything that's wrong. Or you can understand that he works everything that's wrong to your good to bring you to a different place in life. But it says, he has torn us, and He will heal us. He has wounded us, and He will bind up our wounds. He will revive us after two days, and on the third day, He will raise us up so that we can live in His presence. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring showers that water the land. We have been watered. Do you hear me? We have been watered. We've decided to go out here at the road and go to the retention pond and dig a moat. And let this be a castle and put a bridge where you can drive over. Because it is out there. It's too cold right now, but if you come out here in April or May, and you see all that water up at the front, just park your car right at the entrance and look down into that little ditch, and you'll see about a pound and a half bass because he swims from the pond. I've, I've caught him right out of that ditch, running right on up to the edge, caught him. And whatever it is, he comes out there and jumps up. He's there. I know I'm off subject now, but now I've got Spencer's attention because Spencer likes to fish, so now i got his attention. Here's the first element for revive to take place that Hosea is talking about. It's a personal invitation. Remember, to be convinced, there has to be an awareness in you that you need to change. For me to convince you that God wants to revive something in you, you first have to accept the personal invitation of the Holy Spirit who wants to show you that there's something in your life that needs to change. If you're not convinced that anything needs to change, then nothing else is going to happen. If you're not convinced that you need more of God, now I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking more of God and more faith to come alive in you. If you're not convinced of that, then nothing else I say matters. Coming to church no longer matters for you. Serving, tithing, all that stuff no longer matters. But if you understand that the Holy Spirit is constantly giving out personal invitations for you to seek and know Him like He did in Hosea. It happens when that Holy Spirit 
convicts, convinces. Remember the word convict? We said he convicts us. And what was another word for that? Convinces you of the state of dying you're in and that there's a better way to live. It's an invitation. That's the first element that has to happen. And don't think, well, the Holy Spirit ain't telling me. The Holy Spirit is constantly after you and I. Constantly seeking us. Constantly wanting to speak to us. And, put, and I bet you God speaks to us more than we give him credit for. We just don't learn to listen. You do understand there's a difference in hearing and listening. My wife hears me a lot. She don't listen. You know how I know? Because she'll repeat something and I go, well, I've already said, told you that. No, you didn't. Saw a sign at a restaurant last night. Bathroom sign. Bathroom sign that says, men, your restroom is on the left and the women's is on the right because that's what she always is. Right. Okay? So I have to keep saying it for her to finally hear it and listen to it. But he convinces us of that. I believe he talks to us more than we think, more than we realize. We don't know the voice because we're not used to listening for the voice. You know why? Because these other ingredients may not be actively involved in our lives. Here's, the, here's ingredient number two. Revival is the product of the Word of God taking root in someone's life. You need to hear that. In other words, the second element of reviving is simply it's the, it's the product of the Word. It's the product of the Word. It's the product of the Word. If you're not getting in to the love story of God, if you're not reading the journal of God called the Bible, then whatever needs to be revived in you, you may not know what it is. You may not find out what it is. You may not know it. You're just forever searching in the dark. But because you're not in the Word, God's not giving you the answers. He's trying to teach you and show you. Listen, listen, listen what this says. So in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Jesus is talking. And Jesus is talking about being rooted in the Word. Are you hearing me? I don't want to hear any more of this bunk about, well, I don't understand it. There's all kinds of things out there to help you understand it. Get in the Word. It is your lifeline to heaven. I didn't say it was your salvation. He's your salvation, but getting you to survive the trials and the tribulations and the tragedies and all the temptations of the enemy comes from the Word. Listen to how Jesus puts it. He says in John 15, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. Every branch that is in me that does not produce fruit, He cr cuts off, He removes, and He prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the Word. In other words, he's saying you're already a Christian. You're already following me because of the Word that I have put in you. But here's the problem. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. He goes on and on and on, repeating the same phrase. Remain in me and me in you. In other words, stay connected. You know that a cut flower is a beautiful flower, and it can be rich in color and beauty. But do you know that it don't matter how long it sits in that vase, the second it was cut, it was dead. It was dead. And take the water, it can only take so much of the water before it dies anyway. Why? Because it no longer is rooted. A cut flower may be beautiful, but it's still dead. And it ain't long before the beauty will fade. And the only way to remain alive and revived is rooted. In this passage that Jesus outlined, he's talking about reviving, and he gives you the cycle. He said, there's growth, then there's fruit. Then there's pruning. See, right now, I know uh, because of, uh, of a green thumb, I guess you'd say, 
Uh, I know that there are certain things I have to do to certain plants in my yard and certain garden plants. I know that right now the strawberries that are planted, especially with all the water, I have to go out there and make sure that I'm pinching off all of the bl blossoms that are trying to come and all of the brown leaves. Because the blossoms that are blooming right now will simply take the nutrients away from producing strawberries when the season comes. And the brown leaves will fungus into the bush. Right? So I have to prune it. Why? So that I know it will produce more fruit. Right now, if you go look at your crepe myrtles, they got little blooms on them, little, little buds on them. And you know what you're supposed to do? Right now, cut them off. Wow, cut the flowers. No, it stimulates that bush to produce more when the season comes. That's what Jesus is referring to. He says the same thing happens in your life. There are things in your life that are not producing in me anymore, and I want to prune them out so that you'll produce more. There are dead limbs in you. He gave you two limbs in this, book, in this uh, uh, scripture. He said there are dead limbs in you. In other words, there are places in your heart that are cold and hardened to me. And I want to go ahead and cut them out. And then there are other places in your life that you have produced fruit. And I want to prune that so that you'll produce more. It's all about reviving. That's what he's talking about. The whole cycle is growth, fruit, pruning. More growth, more fruit, more pruning. Pruning is the reviving. When you go through things, this is what I'm getting at a while ago. When you go through things and you think, oh, I'm a victim, or you think, well, woe is me. When that happens, the bottom line is, it's not, God's not wanting you to focus on that because that becomes a dead branch. He's saying, notice that I'm pruning in you. Tracy and I have this phrase that we, we talk about, we use sometimes. When, when there are people who we know, nobody in this church, hallelujah. But there are other people that, that, that will call us some younger folks uh, than we are and all that kind of stuff. And they'll want to talk about their horrible day. And their horrible day was they just bought new furniture and when it got there, uh, it wasn't quite the right color. It was white rather than off-white. I said, well, just sit on it a while. It'll get off-white. <laughs> and they want to talk about, they want to talk about how the whole world just fell apart all because they didn't get the credit card they wanted or all because somebody on Facebook didn't like them. Y'all know what that does to me. I ain't got time to preach that one. But Tracy and I will look at one another and she will say, you know what I wanted to say? But did you die? Is your world so bad, but did you die? Okay? So I'm telling you that for a reason. Because remember, I'm going to keep you connected. You can go through something in life and you can allow it to become a dead branch to where you just become a victim and now you stay mad at God, and now you don't want to do this, that, and the other, and you don't want to stay in, in, in close contact with God. So that place in you becomes a dead place. It's not producing anything but negativity. Y'all better stay with me. Okay? And so the Lord says, if you'll stay connected to me, I'll cut that out. Okay? And then I'll go over here, because here's what happens. When I cut that out, it leaves a space. So I want to prune the branches around it, so that they'll produce more fruit and fill that space. Y'all better get this. Somebody better be waking up. This is good stuff. This is what Jesus is saying. So let me keep you, let me keep you connected. So, so you, can be a, you can be a dead branch in whatever situation you're going through, or you can understand God's pruning. Okay? So, so this week, I find myself, because it's easy to do now, we all can, I find myself slipping into dead branch territory. Lord, why did this happen to me? Lord, I don't know what, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and, and you're not, and why did this happen to me? And, and the Lord let me read a passage of Paul. And Paul is writing to the, to the, to the Corinthians. It's in, our, it's in our reading, your first reading. And it says, this is what it says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Paul tells them, he says, I've been shipwrecked three times. 
I floated all night long on a broken piece of ship in the sea. All night long before I was rescued. I've been lied on. I've been spit on. I've been beaten. He says, the religious people gave me 39 stripes. They, whacked, they hit him 39 times, three different times. He was flogged, beat with a belt, 39 stripes. He says, I've been cold. I've been hungry. I've gone without. All this, I'm reading all of this. I'm reading all this. And here's what the Lord says. Mark, do you want the interpretation about your situation out of this? I said, yes, Lord, because I don't understand it. He said, did you die? <laughs> if you didn't, shut up and roll on. Some of you don't roll on. You'd rather roll in it. But the Lord says if you'll just roll on. Are y'all with me? The Lord let me know that, Mark, yeah, you can wrap yourself up in that victim blanket if you want to. But the truth is, did it kill you? Are you dead? If not, then let it go and roll on. So what happened is, I didn't become that dead branch in that area. He just pruned it, and there's going to be more fruit come from it. Are you all with me? Lord, I don't have a lot of time left here. I'm, I'm rolling. So let me just go on. The first element is, it's a personal invitation by the Holy Spirit. If you need something revived, you want your marriage revived, your finances revived, you want something in your life revived, even just your walk with God, then he says there's a personal invitation from the Holy Spirit. Secondly, this reviving will come because it's a product of the Word. Are you in the Word? Thirdly, is the persistence in faith and action. Here's a quote for you. Persistence is the currency for results when asking God for something good. So let me break it down so you understand what that means. Currency is what? Money. So you have to have money to get goods, right? Go uptown and, pay, and get your lunch today and walk out and not pay and see what good you get. All right? So money gets you the goods. Here, the third element for reviving is that persistence is the currency that gets you good. All right? Let me give you some examples. Here's some examples of persistence. Okay? You remember the story in the Bible found in Matthew 9 of the friends who tried to get their, their sick friend. Their friend was on a mat. He was an invalid. He couldn't, he couldn't walk. And, he, and they tried to get him in the door. And people were crowding in, and they could, he couldn't get in. So what did they do? They went up on the roof, and they tore the roof off, right? And they had ropes, and they lowered him down to the ground. Y'all remember that story? That's what you call persistence. How about the woman who worked her way through the crowd? Pastor Jordan preached on it a couple weeks ago. I mean, there's hundreds of people pushed in on Jesus, and she works her way through the crowd, even on her hands and knees, to get to him. It's persistence. How about the friend who knocked on the door late at night and says, Hey, I need some bread from you to feed a visitor that just came. And the friend inside the house said, go away. And he kept knocking. Go away. We're all in the bed. Kept knocking. Go away, I said. Our kids are in the bed. We're tired. And he kept knocking. So the man came to the door and gave him his bread. Persistence. How about the widow's persistence with the judge? Big and powerful man. And she kept meeting him at the door. She didn't have to go in his courtroom. She just get there early morning and sit, sit next to his parking place. And walk him to the door. And she's there at 5 o'clock when he tried to sneak out the other back door. And she's over there at that door. And she shows up at his house, persistence. And he finally said, dear God, I, I may be big and powerful, but this woman is getting on my nerves. And just for the fact of getting her off my case, I'm going to give her what she wants. Persistency is the, is the currency of getting good. In other words, you can't pray the prayer one time and want God to just shazam it. For all of y'all who are my age and older. Shazam, <laughs> Gomer would say. You've got to be persistent. Sometimes I'll even do that with my kids or other people. Let's just see how persistent they'll be. Don't you? Well, why wouldn't God do that to us? Well, Ryan really wants me to do this in his life, but is, he, is it just that he needs it right now, or is it just something, is it something he really, really wants for it to transform him? So I'm going to see if, if Ryan's persistent in it. 
It's persistence. Here's the fourth principle. Folks, it's the process of discipleship. Now, before you get all lost, Lord, what is discipleship? Well, that's a big religious word. Let me just tell you what discipleship is. Can I just tell you? I'm going to boil it down to just this. Here's what discipleship is. Discipleship is following Jesus and helping others follow Jesus. That's just what it is. You, being a student of Jesus, which happens through what? The Word and persistence. You, being a student of Jesus... And helping others become a student of Jesus. And it's a never-ending process for all of you really religious folks who think you know enough of it by now that you don't need to learn any more about Jesus. It's a never-ending learning process to be more like Him. It, discipleship just basically teaches us how to live. And let, let, let me give it to you this way. Here's what discipleship is. It's a new way of thinking and seeing and hearing and feeling and wanting and talking and treating people to do it the way of Christ and not the way of the world. Y'all with me? You see, because the truth is, people want to experience the presence of Jesus personally and in church, but they don't want to pay the price to keep, feel it, keep experiencing it. They only want to experience it here in the altar. They only want to experience it during worship. They only want to experience it when they need it. You know why? Because they're in a place of need. But the truth is, are you willing to pay the price to be revived? You know what the price is? Discipleship. Lord, I want to know how to follow you more. And I know that means that there are some dead areas in me that I've ignored. There's some unforgiveness. There's some bitterness. There's some doubt. There's some questions that are in me. Lord, my home life is awful. Lord, my, my work life is awful. Whatever it is, there's some cold, hard, dead places in me. But I want to walk and be with you more. And I need, you to, I need to let you cut that out. I'm willing to pay the price. And I know, Lord, that when you do that, you're going to also prune some good things in me because you want those good things to fill in the gap with better things. Come on, church. Lastly, lastly, the truth is simply this. If we desire to see God move in extraordinary ways, we must be willing to do some extraordinary things. Now, let me tell you what, what that really means. Because this is what the Lord showed me. Lord, I don't know what extraordinary things I can do. I mean, I can't sing like this person or dance like that or preach like this. I can't do anything extraordinary. And here's what the Lord reminded me. You ready? All right. It's not, extraordinary is not about the big and the glamorous. It's not about the pomp and circumstance, the fanfare of what I, it's like, you ready? Break down the word extraordinary. You just need to be persistent in doing extra ordinary things. What do you mean? I mean like the greatest thing other than my salvation and other than the night that I was baptized in the Spirit. Other than those two things, the greatest move of God in my life didn't happen at an altar or in a worship service or in a concert or even during a desperate need time. The greatest thing that happened was when I was sitting at a desk, just coming to a church to be a pastor, and the Lord said, Mark, I want you to read my word just to know me. And I said, but Lord, I do read your word. He said, no, you've read my word to get a college degree. You've read my word as a, as a textbook to get a master's degree. You read my word to look for answers to questions. You read my word to defend your doctrine against other people's doctrines. You've read my word to study a sermon, but you've never read it as a love story for me to you. You've never read it to get to know me. And in the year of, 20, of 2000, the Lord began to quicken me to take the 
extraordinary step of reading the Word for no other reason than Him. And it's the greatest thing, other than the other two I've mentioned, that's ever happened in my life. It's not extraordinary. You know what's funny? You tell me sometimes how extraordinary this message is and how moving that message was. Man, that was just extraordinary. That was just, I've had that word used, but I'm using it here as a play. It wasn't extraordinary. It was just extra ordinary persistence by invitation to be rooted in the Word. That's all it was. Are you here? You get it? You get it? Lastly, and I know I'm over my time, but I knew today was going to be long. Lastly, here's the fifth, the fifth and final ingredient. Okay, we've got persistence in your faith and in your actions. We've got a process of discipleship, growing more like Jesus, an invitation, a product of the Word, and, and this. Give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to prayer. Now, we ain't going nowhere right now. We're going to be here in a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, okay? Because I did this whole message to get to this point. In the Bible, any time there was a reviving, any time God turned a nation back on its head, any time God radically changed lives or circumstances, any time that happened, it was the results of persistent prayer. There was no quick and easy way to revive something. In other words, it's not casual prayer. It's not convenient prayer. I'll do it when it's convenient. It's not common prayer. These principles that I've talked about must be active in our thoughts and in our actions and in our habits because there's a price involved in seeing it happen. So let me ask you. Do you want to see a reviving in the lives of your children and grandchildren today? Teenagers and young adults, you've heard all these old people, talking about me, you never, talk about God, and I remember God for some reason has kept my mind in that little window of a, of a teenager to think like, well, you know, when you get older and you learn it, then that's one thing. Or when you get older and you don't have a lot else to do in life, sit around and you become a good Christian. It's not really for me right now. It's not something that I really need to, need to work on right now. I could work on it later. I don't understand it all. It doesn't make sense. I get it. I get it. But if you really want to test God to see if He's real and alive and can change your life and your situation, these are the things you have to do. And if we really want to see a reviving, coming alive in us, the move and the work of Jesus Christ, and in this community, and in our nation, And there's some things we got to do. <clears throat> Months ago, when I was working on the end of year and looking towards our prayer and fasting, and I've told you this in the first, ser first sermon of the series, that we do our prayer and fasting in January, along with other churches and other things. And the Lord quickened me and said, no, I want you to put it aside. <clears throat> I want you to wait and do the prayer and fasting later. And I'll give you the, I'll give you the direction of that. And in the meantime, I came across pastor after pastor who God was saying the same thing. I need, to, I need to talk a minute. Can I do that? Just pastor after pastor of God saying, don't do your prayer and fasting. I want you to do this instead because I want to revive this church. I, 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 our, our general superintendent, Randy Carter, said the Lord gave him a word for the denomination. And you know what it was? 
Hosea 6. Return to the Lord. For the whole year this year, the conference is fo- focusing on returning, taking steps to return to the Lord among all their churches. Recently, recently we came across a song and we were listening to the song, Jordan and I, and I said, well, find out where the album is. I want the album. And, and the album is by Wren Collective. And the album came out the end of 2020, somewhere in the middle of the end of 2020. Do you know what the title of the album is? Revival Anthem. That the songs written were written by the Spirit of God in their hearts to bring their nations back to a place of revival. You got to understand, God's up to something. COVID doesn't have the last word. Chaos doesn't have the last word. The sovereign hand of God has the last word. And He seeks to bring breath and life and truth and justice back into the hearts of His people. But you and I have to be able to do more than clap. There's a price to pay. And you see, when I was thinking of our prayer and fasting, I wanted it nice and neat in the package like we've always done it. And the Lord said, Mark, are you wanting to just go through the routine or do you want to pay a little bit of a price? Huh? What's your price, Lord? I'm a victim. I don't have time. I'm really tired. Don't make it too steep. Isn't that sorry? That's how we do the Lord when He's trying to give us something good. So He gave it to me. I am not in charge of the results of this. God is. I'm only in charge to make it available. If you didn't pick one up, <clears throat> they're at the table in the lobby. We start, what's today's day? 31st. Yep, tomorrow. We start our prayer and fasting tomorrow, February 1st, February 22nd. 21 days of prayer and fasting. And what this is, <clears throat> it's a layout that I think the Lord gave me. So let me read it to you because you'll have to go get yours if you didn't get one. So on the Mondays of the fast, which is tomorrow night, every Monday, I've already met with my church board and I've already met with my ministry leaders. But on Monday nights, I'm asking all the leadership of this church to come out here for prayer. Yep, give up their time, come out here for prayer as leaders of this church. Set the standard as leaders. On Tuesday nights, and this is 6.30 to 7-ish, and the reason why I said ish is because if we get done in the prayer time of of 7 o'clock, great. But if the Holy Spirit is doing a work, then we're going to let Him do His work. That's why I said ish. If you're a guest here today, you're more invited. God's speaking to you about reviving things. You're more than invited. This isn't just for this church. This is for anybody. But our leadership will be here on Monday nights. On Tuesday nights, if you're a prayer partner, and here's what I mean by a prayer partner. You come on Sundays and you you give up time to pray in there. God wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning like Miss Judy, and he calls you to pray about me or pray about this church, pray about something. Uh, That that means you're a prayer partner. He done pulled you in. Uh, If you're a person who just has a constant drip of praying throughout the day, you're a prayer partner. If you're a person who's been praying that God would elevate your prayer life and open up your prayer life, hello, you have an opportunity to put your words to action. Tuesday nights is the prayer partner's night. Anybody who has the, the gift or the, or the need or the desire or the, or the drive for prayer, I want you to come out here at 630. Wednesday nights, we're going to, the college age is going to sacrifice a little bit, our college age class, so that Pastor Jordan can be in here. And on Wednesday nights, we're going to have worship and word. It's just going to be a flowing of worship music and prayer. Just praying. When the Spirit moves on you to pray in the authority, y'all better understand what's happening here. I can already sense it. We're going to strike a match of revival. Thursdays and Fridays is your personal time. Your personal time. Your personal time. You pray. You fast and pray on Thursdays and Fridays. I'm going to talk about fasting next week. If you've never fasted, I'm going to talk about it next week. But whether you fast one day, three days, 21 days, one meal a day, whatever it is, you ain't got to do the whole 21, but that's the, that's the time we're doing it. Okay? 
But Thursdays and Fridays is your time. Last year in the fast, God put it on my heart, and usually when the fast is over, I, I, I'm done with it. But he put it on my heart last year to do this. And every time I thought I was done with it, he said, you're not. And this year as I was praying about the fast, what do you want me to fast for? What's the focus that I should fast for? He said, I want you to continue the fast that I gave you a year ago. And the fast he gave me a year ago was to pray for all of my nieces and nephews. To stand in the gap for the hell that they might be facing. That I don't have to know the answers. I just know that if God awakens me with a name, I'm going to pray in the warring spirit of God. And he gave it to me last January. And you know what he gave me as the year went on? Can I just confess it to you? I'm just going to confess it to you. That when I walk in here, you know what I do now? I call out every name of every young person in this building. I call out all of the Hennett kids. I call out, I call out uh, Riley and Kennedy. I call out all of the kids, all of those teenagers, all of those young people. I call God as my witness. Now it has ballooned from my nieces and nephews to I'm calling out the names of every teenager I know that's in this building, every young person I know that comes to church here. And I just say, Lord, if I forgot a name, give it to me. And I'll call it out in prayer. And I pray. I pray. Carly Ray, Cheyenne, I pray for every teenager in this place. Because I thought the devil was bad after us. He seeks to totally rip the hearts out of every young person today to where they would be cold and callous towards anything of God. So Thursdays and Fridays is your day to pray over your extended family. Pray over your church family. Then on Saturday nights, really, Lord, you want us? Come on, Lord. Saturday night. Saturday nights at 630 I'm asking the congregation, anybody who can or will, to come into this place for just about 30 minutes or so. Because here's what I think God is saying. If you really want to see this revival you pray about and talk about, show it to me. Show me how desperately you want it, how desperately you need it. Show me. And see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. So that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Lobby, if you didn't pick one up, lobby, the little round table. There's one out there. If you work a third shift job or you work in a way that you can't come out here, get one and during that day be praying these, these things. What are we going to pray for? Well, there's stations that we've always kept up since last year. They're on the walls. There's stations of things you can walk to and pray over those things. But really what we're praying for is the Spirit of God to revive in us an awakening to move in His Spirit and power. Praying for salvations, baptisms of the Spirit, baptisms in general. All of that. An awakening of God. Does anybody want that?